So I was just, um, I mean, I think um, Bezad has really covered so many of the points, um, especially on the human ethics. But um, I just thought I'd quickly raise a few issues because I think it's something that's forever changing and should be discussed. Um, so um, obviously, as this whole um, discussion has shown, wildlife photography is very powerful and it can speak much about the wildlife. It can you know, bring empathy. It can bring, I mean, not just the wildlife, but the life of the mountains and whatever. I think nobody needs education on that. And I think given that we're talking to a conservation audience, um, most of this is, you know, already known, but um, for general photographers, I think it's something that needs to be emphasized always, which is that the wildlife you're photographing should always be paramount and, you know, nothing should ever be sacrificed just for the shot. Um, so whether it's wildlife or human, as Beza said, the it, subject must be given full respect for wildlife. This means understanding them and, you know, honoring their wild wildness. For people, it's um, the opposite. It also means understanding, but you have to honor their lack of wildness and therefore not photograph them without permission and um, them wanting to be um, photographed. As I put in the chat earlier, when I first went to Ladakh, people were very reluctant to have their photograph taken because they believed that um, when you took their image, it took their soul. So they were worried that they would die shortly afterwards. So it was, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of photographs from those early days. So basically wildlife photography is really about nature first. And in my day, which is back in the eighties, um, it was really all about learning about a species, understanding it, tracking it, predicting its behavior, and patiently waiting for opportunities to unfold. So, I mean, this was a black bear from Dutch Gum. I spent, you know, we were filming. So when you're filming, you need to spend at least a year. In those days, we had the luxury of spending a year in one place so we could cover all the seasons. And uh, this is in a plum tree. So I think for all of us, wildlife conservation is the aim. So um, that's good, but it's, it certainly isn't true now. Um, so these are just some of the basic, you know, rules that we all know, obey the law, no crowding, no chasing, minimal disturbance, no speeding, no off-roading, fragile areas, no catching, handling, manipulation, stressing, night flash. You know, unfortunately, we see a lot of tourists who don't adhere to these. So I think they do have to be repeated, you know, often and often. But it varies from species to species, obviously. And much has changed since my time. I and mean, when I was working, we were such a small handful of photographers, you could count us on one hand or two hands within India, I'm talking. And numbers do change things. For you know, example, in the 80s, we made a film on the great Indian bustard, which included the, their nesting, courtship, or you know, habit. And now I'm reading that um, the, um, they, they're so disturbed by people in their area that they stopped doing everything. So they have had to restrict the number of photographers that can be there in the breeding season. Another difference from my time was that it was really hard to see any wildlife. It was just the beginning of, um, you know, the effects of Project Tiger and other conservation um, protection from hunting and all, but the animals were still extremely shy. And so in those days there was um, even live baiting because in some instances that you know was really the only way you'd ever get to see anything like a big carnivore. And um, there were in those days no films on tiger and the first film that was being made did actually use live bait in order to be able to film the tiger. And as one biologist partially justified this, he uh, gave the view that there were plenty more buffaloes than tigers and that um, to sacrifice one to create a film to pull in audience for a conservation message to get across um, seemed to be not unreasonable. Again, you know, this was a sort of one-off for one film crew. Now, when you have so many, um, you know, it wouldn't, and for other reasons also, it would not be so acceptable. But the point is that it was to create a good conservation argument. It wasn't just to 
notch up a selection of, you know, add to your selection photographs and get your likes on Instagram um, up. So the big controversies are indeed baiting, you know, whether it's a live bait or even with whether it's a dead bait. And along with that, luring with sound. I'm just showing this picture partly as a joke because in a sense you could call it baiting, it wasn't, but um, I do have something edible in my hand that the fox appreciates, but the fox was not a wild one. It was um, a tame one that I had reared for the previous six months that had been uh, captured when it was a baby and the forest department had given it to me to rear. And this was when we were rewilding it. So it had already become quite shy, but it um, you know, was still hanging around a bit. So uh, it was actually attracted um, by something to, for this photograph. But the thing about um, baiting and luring with sound, I think are very, um, I'll put some questions later on and see what people think about it. And we can discuss the pros and cons because there are both. There's a little bit of black, a little bit of white and a whole lot of gray as somebody said. And much is in the method and in the degree. And now I'm just gonna show you a couple of images. I took um, screen grabs from films I found on the net when I was photographing filming in Ladakh the marmot was one of the most shy creatures that you could hardly get close to. And now I'm seeing the um, tourists on the way to Pangong so have so tamed them that they come and beg like macaques. This one's got a biscuit in front and the people are looking at it. And here again, you know, they're all, and to me, it was just so shocking to see this because this animal is not one that behaves like this. And it could also be very dangerous because they are a hibernating creature. They need to put on the right reserves of fat for the winter and eating biscuits and all could be um, very detrimental from that point of view, but it also makes them vulnerable because to predators, especially of the human kind, because they are eaten, their fur is used. So if they're this habituated, you know, when the tourists are not there, somebody more poacher could be. So here are some questions. Um, which, um, how do we do this um, cost of? I think they're more to raise discussion um, and interesting to know what people think yes and no are. Um, I'll just read them out. So do you think it's okay? I've given five scenarios. So one is, was it okay to put salt out to attract deer to a particular spot where you can set up a discrete hide to photograph them? The second one is, would it be, would you consider it okay to move a carcass to an accessible valley so that um, tourists and photographers could photograph snow leopard or other carnivores on it? Three, would you use a live mouse to attract a raptor? There's a lot of um, live mouse use for owls, particularly snowy owls in the UK, in the uh, US. Four is, would you think it was okay to put the, an insect in the fridge for long enough to slow it down for macro photography? And five, um, how do you feel about luring with calls, particularly playing territorial calls to attract birds? So, Buster, maybe we can, um, shall I stop sharing now or shall I keep these questions on the screen? Maybe, maybe if you could, maybe if you could kind of leave the questions on. Yeah. Uh, because these are such valuable questions and they're very nicely leading us also to the next section where we'll quickly and very briefly discuss a photographer's manifesto that we had put together to get people's inputs and views as well. So yeah, th th these are really valuable uh, and very relevant questions. Maybe we can leave them over here for a while and then people can respond in chat or turn on their microphones to answer uh, point by point if they're okay or the consolidated opinions about these. That'll be really wonderful. Thank you. Oops, have you lost my screen? Uh, half of it. Yeah, because I was trying to get to the chat, but I don't seem to be able to see it. Along so what screen. you can do is, what you can do is when you go to share screen, you can actually share just this, view rather than your old screen, if you want. Well, that's actually what I meant. I mean, that's what it is doing. It's just showing a portion of my screen. Ah, okay. 
Right. So, so maybe, maybe if, you, if you can read out anything. That... Right. Yep. So I'll, I'll just read the questions again, uh, whether it's OK to put out salt to attract deer to a particular spot where you can set up a discrete height for photography. Um, is it OK to bring a carcass to an accessible valley to attract snow leopard or other carnivores? Is it OK to use a live mouse to attract a raptor? Is it okay to put an insect in the fridge to slow it down? And is it okay to play territorial calls to attract birds? Many of these five points that you see here, I mean, it's a subset of many other practices that a lot of photographers tend to use or are still, um, they still employ. Um, so yeah, and some opinions. Not, you know, it is a. There are a lot of gray areas. There's not Absolutely. a correct or incorrect yes. answer to these, and much is contextual. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, th th yeah, that was the point I was just trying to add. That you know, no answer is the right answer or the wrong answer. And as maybe Joanna mentioned, whilst the while people are thinking and giving their comments, mm -hmm. I, the other aspect that I haven't covered, which I sort of wanted to bring up, was that, you know, in my day, as I was saying, you know, there was only one wild snow leopard photograph, which was George Shallows. Yeah. Um, and things are very different now. And also the fact that there are, you know, millions of photographers, not just half a dozen. And it makes a huge difference. I mean, we're talking about the use of photography for conservation reasons, but, you know, a lot of photography now is just to show off your ability to get the picture. And the danger of this with, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all, I mean, just Horseshoe Bend is the sort of archetype for this, which <clears throat> in 2012 used to get 1,000 visitors a year, a year, annually 1,000. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> within five years, because of a couple of pictures on Instagram came along and some photographs were put on there, five years later, they're getting 4,000 a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> so from 1,000 a year, it's gone up to 4,000 a day. There are some 620,000 posts on Instagram of Horseshoe wow. Bend. They've now had to build car parks, put up railings. You know, it's a whole new situation. And yeah, sure. this is what Instagram has the power to do. And I think Ishmael's not here, but I think he does he not talk about one of his snow leopard photographs being mm -hmm. a sort of catalyst to a huge influx of photographers to the Spiti area. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as photographers, we need to very much be aware of how our images are going to be used, how they're going to, you know, what effect they're going to have. Absolutely. And it's not just images, of course, it's films also. I mean, Ladakh has been totally impacted by the film The Three Idiots because of the three scenes there. Uh, Tourism, you know, went from 70,000 a year to now over, um, you know, nearly three lakh people. Wow. And 90% of them are only going to see those two, three sites that appear yeah. in the... Um, Three idiots film, they're not interested in anything else. <laughs> so there's a lot more to presenting images than just, you know, wanting to yep. show your own. Absolutely. Yep. So we do have a couple of points here already. Matt says, uh, personally, I find the first one less problematic than the other four, but I assume you might still put the deer in danger of predation that it might otherwise not be in. Yeah, no, I think Matt's hit the nail on the head in the sense that, <laughs> you know, if if I'm doing it in a small patch of forest that only I have access to, it may be okay. But if it's a public area that hunters and other people use, you yeah. know, and you do it over an extended period of time, then it can be in danger. So, you know, again, one always has to come back to what effect is it going to have on the animal that you're um, photographing both, uh, I mean, you're manipulating both Absolutely. from its ecological point of view, but also its vulnerability to other humans and predators. Totally. And I remember, Joanna, you were mentioning yesterday about the, uh, the point about territorial calls. Flavia also says that 
number five is very commonplace for bird photography nowadays. Yeah, um, and not just bird photography. I understand that's what all the bird guides do in the Northeast. They wow. take your, um, you know, the bird group out. They're not even photographing, just to show it to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can argue that actually, you know, you're doing it from the roadside. It stops your 20 people of the group going in and stomping around looking for this hard to see bird. So maybe you're not affecting the whole population. But for some of us, um, you know, it's a little hard to swallow to take it to that degree. But it's a difficult one. You know, again, we all feed birds. There's, you know, there's still a question mark as to sometimes whether that affects negatively or positively. I mean, it goes both ways very often. But, totally. but I think territorial calls, you know, is more easily can be seen to be detrimental. But there are also a few pros that you could say to that yeah. depending on, again on how it's used if you you know if you just mm -hmm. do it a little bit it's relative it's reckoned to be relatively okay but if you do it over a prolonged period of time then it's problematic yeah and and, and by a little bit and prolonged it also means how many people right i mean if if 100 people do a little bit then that's like 100 minutes already <laughs> whereas mm -hmm. one person just doing that so i think that's where the number point, uh, issue that you mentioned Absolutely. earlier becomes very Every important. Every time, yeah, a number issue comes I, in. And, and there is a very interesting paper I remember reading about the, the negative impacts of uh, using these playback methods on the species breeding biology itself and yeah. it's a, yeah. you know and its uh, survival rate over long term. So, so I think some of these are um, even researched and I think they, they should influence uh, or ideally, they should be, they should influence people making it the right and the, uh, and the right decision about those. Um, okay. What are people saying about number two? Because that's the most relevant to our snow leopard snow area. Leopard. Right? Yep. Do people think that's acceptable or not acceptable? Yeah. Um, Anybody? Point two, number two, big no, 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 big no, absolute no. <laughs> Definitely a huge no. There we go. And for what reasons? Bezad? Oh, me? Okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, what we have seen is, um, A, if... Uh, uh, you're habituating for almost all these places, you know, the carcasses are uh, put so close to human habitation that you are habituating predators um, to associate the village or the habitation with food. And so eventually, if they are, if a domestic livestock is a major part of their diet, that is what they're looking for in the meadows, in the fields, in um, all these instances where they are um just going to then get into conflict the whole, yeah. whole point of um you know conservation tourism for us is to uh allow more wild ungulates to replace livestock and so if if instead the livestock becomes a critical part of the snow leopard's food chain that is literally the opposite um happening and again you know just the ethics involved. I think, I think we've progressed quite a bit in terms of uh, the ethical um, approach to what wildlife photography is and how it's practiced over the last few decades. And this is just regressing uh, along those lines. And so, you know, I think um, Matt's also mentioning using drones in wildlife um, photography and filmmaking. We never use drones just because it's pointless to uh, scare the heck out of a bunch of blue sheep. Um, and it's not going to give you that great of a shot. For um, I've, I've seen some really great footage of blue whales and whales in general, and I always find that to be a much better use of um, drones to to look at it from an oce oceanic perspective. For animals in Africa, they're actually used to having bushcraft, bush aircraft um, trail them. That's also a great way to take pictures of them. They're relatively unaffected by because the machines are at a much higher altitude um but for snow leopards there's no there's no point for drones i'm yeah no i i, I think bezad has put it very nicely and he's absolutely right about carcass baiting 
And I think, uh, didn't Suhail show us some sad footage of a bear trying with its cub trying to climb a hill that was affected by a drone? Oh, yes. Was... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that was a video. Uh, uh, wasn't that you? Uh, yeah, I remember in one of the sessions we discussed one that picture session. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. But what, uh, um, what is the answer for this carcass? Because I believe it still goes on, or maybe not, but it certainly has been going on in some of our snowlipid areas. So how do we dissuade people from doing this? Well, from, from a tour operator's perspective, um, since we do know about this, um, for, um, so without naming names, we do not go to valleys where we suspect this is happening. The, it, it is, I'm still unsure about the legalities of this, but we outright say that we do not go here because we suspect that this may be a problem and we do not want to put your tourism dollars that you're spending on um, encouraging this. We will, if we can, um, if we get reports that it's actually a wild animal that's been killed, like an ibex or a blue sheep, then we will take guests there. But for the most part, whenever we hear kills, um, we really have to do a lot of digging to learn that it is um, a baby zoo or a baby yak. And that basically just means that um, there's no surety of whether this was a, an actual kill or it wasn't, because we've heard villagers tell us um, actually tell us that, oh no, this, this one died at night. And so we just put it up over there where we saw the snow leopard yesterday. And so if, if that is happening, then um, it's problematic to um, put dollars into that equation because then you are basically um, creating um, an economy that flourishes on that. And so the only way to do it is to basically be good consumers about it. You know, if, if when you go to a store and you select a product that is good for you and that is organic and you pay for that, um, you are making a conscious choice by not supporting the um, more unethical or um, perhaps more damaging variant of whatever that product is. So I think we basically have to educate the public about this and teach them about how they can be more educated consumers of such services. And do they, are they sympathetic? Do you find generally? If, if you set the right context, absolutely. So we have actually, once we have learned that the carcass on, a, on, a, on the hill has been placed um, and is not a kill, we've actually turned our tourists around half an hour after getting there at seven in the morning and headed- And they've accepted that. They accepted that, they were okay with that. And then that evening we had three sightings with a mother and two cubs right above wow. our tents. <laughs> Congratulations, you deserve it. <laughs> they, it, was, it was basically the universe rewarding us for our... Yeah, really. Uh, totally, totally, yes. Very good. <laughs> this is wonderful. I, I, I think, uh, Joanna and Bezad, bo for both of you, there's a very good question out here from, uh, from Sibel. Oh, where did I lose the question? Um, wait, what happened to the question? I'm so sorry. Um, here, oh, I've so got she, it. She says, should we stop sharing wildlife yes, photos? Yes, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> there's a question. Yes, there's a question. Uh, these stories really raise important questions. Should we stop sharing wildlife photos? How I, can we stop having detrimental effect? And I think uh, once you've answered this, we will we, we'll take the same question to the next session, Bezad, where you can lead us through this uh, a draft of a manifesto. So yeah, uh, after you, please, Joanna. Yeah, I think um, I think she answered it herself in some ways in the earlier session that, you know, I don't think we should stop sharing wildlife photos at all, but I do think we have to do it with some conscious um, thought and um, in the context of the story of how and where. Um, Great. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, um, you, we need the wildlife photos. We need people to be engaged. We need people to um, 
engage with the wildlife photos through the stories that we are crafting as conservationists. Because if we lose control of telling the story, then wildlife photos will be shared by people who don't have conservation at heart. So it's important for us to, instead of um, ignoring the situation, to actually kind of try to take control of it and say, this is the right way to do it. And these are the ethics around us. And um, essentially uphold or try to uphold or try to um, maybe even shame uh, people who are actually endangering wildlife or communities or, you know, because of this habituation. Um, imagine, you know, snow leopards don't attack humans. Imagine if you're doing this with a tiger. Imagine if you're doing this with a Siberian tiger. It would just have the tigers shot eventually in retaliation or have people killed in retaliation. So it's just a major problem. And so we need to tackle this head on by um, telling the story. And so I think that's very important. Yeah, and, and there was a very yeah, interesting absolutely. point by Matt, but Jonah, you've already answered that. So I, I don't, that, that's so true, unfortunately, you know, I mean, there's so few of the true wildlife photographers out there. And this quick, short, dirty means to get some of those pictures uh, for whatever reasons, I think that that still unfortunately is. And is as, one, as one person pointed out, there's so much not wildlife photographers that if you Absolutely. see them in the national parks, they're quite <laughs> happy to hand their camera to the guide to get a, yeah. for him to actually take the photograph. <laughs> so it, it so is true. a very different kind of person. So true. So true. And, and I think, Matt, the point you raise and the discussion that has gone, uh, uh, the way the discussion has moved with Joanna's presentation, it leads us very nicely to the last segment. Bizad, if you could kindly lead us through it, where we discuss how an organization which can be a user, quotes, con or slash consumer, slash distributor of these images, uh, maybe they can also play a role there. Uh, Bezat, over to you. Would you would you mind sharing that? Um, oh yes. Document? Okay. Uh, 